So I'm going to share some of my experiences in developing a data science organization within the oil and gas industry. Um, I might touch on a few of our projects, but mostly I'm going to talk about the organizational and workforce uh, development of an organization. Uh, I'm going to assume that we all understand the need for a data science organization. Uh, three to five years ago, maybe the discussion was around selling uh, the value that data science could provide uh, or data science can provide within the oil and gas industry. But I think uh, we've seen a number of use cases and success stories across the industry in the last few years. Uh, we have in, in, internally at Anadarko, and so uh, hopefully that shifts the focus. First of all, the viewpoints and thoughts that uh, I'm sharing are entirely my own and uh, so are not representative of Anadarko, necessarily. Uh, Anadarko. Who are we? Uh, we're a large independent oil and gas uh, EMP company. In 2017, we produced 672,000 BOE per day. Um, so we're a large independent oil and gas company, but we're obviously not at the scale of the Exxons and the Chevrons and, and any of the majors, BP and Shell. And we produce from uh, several different assets. Uh, our three primary assets are U.S. onshore uh, DJ Basin in Colorado, Delaware Basin in western Texas, and then uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico. We also have uh, several international assets and several other onshore assets. So we aren't at the scale of, of the majors, and so we aren't involved in the exascale computing projects that we talked about yesterday or uh, developing a large uh, supercomputers on site. However, we still have a number of complex and diverse challenges where we can uh, you know, leverage uh, expertise from uh, data scientists. And uh, so it's important for us to uh, develop uh, those skill sets internally and uh, create that uh, organization. As you develop a data science strategy, the most, uh, it starts with the development of you know, what is your strategy. And here's a hint. Don't Hire a bunch of data scientists, and I'm messing it up again. Sorry. Do I just? All right. Do you just? You you can't just hire data scientists and throw them into the business and expect for them to solve all of your business problems. How do I know that? Because that's how we started. That's how we tried. And uh, you need to give a lot more thought to you know how are you developing this organization? How are you developing this talent? There's a lot of things that you need to consider. So what does data science look like at Anadarko? Uh, currently, this is what it looks like. Uh, back in late 2016, really uh, uh, at the support of our CEO, we created the Advanced Analytics and Emerging Technologies Organization. The AAET, we reflect, affectionately uh, refer to it as the eight. And what we did was we, we brought together an organization of data scientists along with subject matter experts, and so petroleum engineers and geoscientists. And we took them out of the day-to-day -day operations, let them focus 100% on these projects. And I feel like that is crucial for success, bringing your subject matter experts together with your data scientists so that you can work on these data science problems, you can iterate together, you can innovate together, you can develop these prototypes. Next, we work with our uh, our development operations group within our eight organization in taking our prototypes and productionalizing those. Our DevOps organization works very closely with our IT organization. We also have a business strategy team, which is outward facing, looking at strategic partnerships. Um, you know, what are some of the emerging trends that we're seeing outside of the company, outside of the industry? Uh, you know, what are some of the technologies that we can bring in um, some of these pilots that uh, we'll undertake, they may be aligned with some of our core efforts by our core team, but some of those projects may also be uh, uh, you know, outside of our core focus areas. Uh, since we have our subject matter experts within our A organization, we have tiebacks and relationships back to our business. And so that's some of our touch points uh, you know, with these domain experts. We also work closely with our subsurface and technology teams and our key assets in our DJ asset in Colorado and our Delaware uh, asset in Western Texas. It's a number of uh, 
projects and successes we had in 2017. Uh, I may talk about some other projects as well. So. I've, I've, in my opinion, I feel like there are five components that are critical to success for a data science organization. And if you don't trust me, I stole this from Amy Gershkoff. Uh, Amy was the CDO at Ancestry.com, Zynga before that. Uh, she led the global data science team at, at eBay as well. Um, so let's touch on each one of these. First of all, where is your data science organization located? It's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to this question. You know, it may depend, you know, it, it may be different for your organization, for your company. But you need to give careful consideration and thought about where you're locating it. Because where you place your data science organization defines the success criteria for that organization. For example, if you are interested in driving revenue and operations efficiency, don't place your data science organization under your CIO within IT. If you're interested in a true research and development type of organization where you're looking at your moonshot projects that may take multiple years, may provide value, may not, may be high, you know, high probability of failure, you don't want to place that organization under your CFO where they're more interested in reducing and controlling costs. There's also additional ramifications on where you place your data science organization, such as attracting talent. You know, I know a number of data scientists who do not want to work for a data science organization which reports through the CIO, through IT, because they feel like it's too disconnected from the business, from the actual business problems. Um, alternatively, there are data scientists that may not want to work in R&D because these are long projects. They want to see immediate business impact and business value. On the other hand, there are data scientists that maybe want to work in R&D. You know, more of your research scientists, they're interested in that. So just understanding that the placement of your data science organization, you know, has a number of ramifications and you need to understand, um, you know, what you're looking for and what are the success criteria for that organization. You also have to have realistic expectations of your data science organization and of your data scientists. You cannot bring in data scientists to fix a broken business model. If you have a bad asset, you cannot bring in data scientists and expect for them to turn that asset around and make it commercially viable. They may be able to improve efficiencies and do certain things, but um, you know, they're, they're not the cure-all, the, the magical bean that can, that can fix everything. So have, have realistic expectations of your data scientists. Have real ex realistic expectations of the scope of work and of the timelines. I've, I've met with business users who were pleasantly surprised that uh, data scientists could turn around a prototype in two to four weeks for some project. Alternatively, you talk to other business users and they're shocked that it takes two to four weeks to turn around something. And so they, they, they wonder, don't you just go back there and press a few buttons and out of your black magical box, you know, come some results. We're not pitching results over the fence and getting results uh, back, you know. So have realistic expectations of what your data scientists can, can pr provide. Next point is uh, organization integration. I mentioned it previously, uh, how important I think it is to integrate with your subject matter experts. That also needs to be a daily activity. You know, that's why it was key for us to bring our subject matter experts into the eight along with our data scientists. You know, this is, this is a collaborative environment. You know, this, as I mentioned, you can't just pitch it over the fence and let the data scientists go off and work something and then get the results back. We've done that with, with previous consulting companies. You know, send them a data set. You know, let's see what you get back. Well, it's probably not gonna be very good because they don't understand the problem. They don't understand the domain. They haven't worked through it. They haven't been steered uh, down the process. And so close collaboration with your subject matter experts is, is very critical. Communication with the business is also very important. Having the relationships and the trust and developing that with the business is extremely important. You know, the goal of a lot of our data science projects is to deliver business value, is to have an impact, is to drive decision making. And if you don't have that relationship with the business and you put something in their hands, 
how likely are they to actually use that to affect business decisions? Not very. So make sure that you have a, a good relationship with the business, work closely with the business, keep up that constant communication. Just don't ask us how it's done because we're still working on that. Um, priorities change, goals change, funding changes. So your success criteria changes. You need to understand, you know, what is your success criteria? How are you measuring it? You know, continually looking at that. And uh, so you understand, uh, you, you know, what is the bar that we need to be reached? How do we need to evolve? How do we need to improve our processes so that we can be successful? Finally, what's your operating model? Are you an ad hoc data science organization? Do you just receive requests from the business? Do you go out trying to, to pitch your services, asking for projects? Um, or do you have a really defined process in allocating work and uh, identifying projects and priority, uh, prioritizing projects? Uh, at Anadarko, we use an agile scrum framework where it's a, a little bit more agile. Uh, we work in uh, agile teams and we develop backlogs and, and we work through those. And then as we move to production, maybe switch to more of a hybrid approach, a little more of the traditional, uh, you know, IT, you know, uh, foundations and uh, along with, a, you know, kind of an agile methodology. But understanding what is your operational model, providing training around that, you know, your subject matter experts, your data scientists perhaps don't have training in some of these different areas. So, so providing training so they can be most effective as they're working through that. All right, third point, HR. Talent is key. Shocking, surprising, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, it really is the most important piece in developing a data science organization. All of us in here, all of our companies, we're competing for talent. And, uh, you know, data scientists are not always easy to come by. You know, and so we need to understand that and we need to figure out how do we want to re uh, attract, hire, and retain talent. But guess what? We're not just competing with the companies in this room. We're not just competing with the oil and gas industry. We're not just competing with the Houston market. We're competing with the coast. We're competing with New York and Boston and California and Washington and Oregon and Google and Microsoft and Facebook and NVIDIA and all the companies that are here. And so what is your message? How are you attracting, hiring, and retaining talent? You have to give some thought around that. You also have to work with HR. This is the simple stuff, but it, it needs to be said. You, know, you have to develop a job title. You have to develop a career ladder. What are your career de development opportunities for your data scientists? What are, is your compensation structure? Um, you know, originally, we didn't even really think about that. Let's just go hire some data scientists. Oh, now they want to advance in their career. Now they want to move. What, what, what do we put in place so that they can do that? So some thought has to give, be given around that. Also, you have to work very closely with your recruiters. Um, you know, your recruiters are your interface to your potential candidates. You know, they're the front line. They're the ones that are answering the questions that these potential candidates have. How are they answering those questions? What types of problems are you working on? You know, are they challenging? What type of technology are you using? What's your data infrastructure? All of those things, you have to work closely with your recruiters so that they can speak intelligently to your candidates. So as we look to recruit, attract, and retain the best talent, we also have to understand what matters to our data scientists. Am I worried about retention of my data scientists? You bet, every day. You know, what matters to my data scientists? We feel like we've developed a pretty strong team and I want to make sure that we can retain that team. I want to make sure that we can attract new data scientists in the future. And so what are they looking for? Maybe the workforce environment or the workplace environment. At Anadarko, we scrubbed a floor and, and rebuilt it. People call it the Google floor in our building. Why did we do that? We did it because we looked at our other floors and we felt like they were not collaborative in nature. We, they were not built around a data science type of team or an eight organization. 
So we developed a workplace that now we feel like uh, can attract the type of talent that we're looking for. Also, about 90% of our data scientists are PhDs. They want to publish. They want to speak. But we work in an industry and a company that historically has been very tight-lipped. So how do we provide those opportunities? How do, we, how do we, you know, we're not a service company. You don't see a ton of Anadarko papers out there. Um, you know, how do we provide those as opportunities for our data scientists if they so choose? You know, also, what, uh, what other things are they interested in? What types of technology are you using? Is it cutting edge? What's your compensation structure look like? Is it appropriate for the market? What are your career development opportunities? So all of those things we think about as we're, we're thinking about attracting and retaining talent. Finally, and I built this slide before Jan had any of his comments yesterday or this morning, but uh, building out the best team requires diversity. And uh, you know, Jan mentioned it. We need to do a better job of attracting and hiring female talent. I completely agree with that. But we need, also need diversity across a number of areas, gender, uh, you know, culture, educational background, diversity of thought. So I am proud to say, as Ahmed uh, mentioned this morning, you know, our data science organization, we're about 30% female. I'm happy about that. Are we where we need to be at 50-50? No, we aren't. But, um, you know, we're working towards that. We also have a very culturally diverse team. Uh, you know, re representing a, a number of backgrounds and, and countries and viewpoints. Finally, we also have a very diverse uh, educational background on our team. I'm a statistician by background. I'm partial to statisticians. But the last thing that Anadarko needs is a team full of statisticians. So we have statisticians and applied mathematicians and computational mathematicians and computer scientists and computer and electrical engineers and aerospace engineers and industrial engineers and CFD engineers and astrophysicists and physicists. You know, that diversity background is very important because these are very complex problems that we're looking at. And innovation is going to come from some of the other industries, from some of these other domains that we're going to bring an idea and we're going to be able to crack that nut. So that diverse background is very important. Next is uh, your data infrastructure. I've only been in the oil and gas industry since 2014, but I was surprised coming to the industry how little attention was paid to our data. You know, the, the quality of the data, the infrastructure, the technology of the data. Well, our data scientists spend a large part of their time working with that data. So what is the architecture you're looking at? What technology are you using? You know, What's the quality of the data? Is it QA'd regularly? Are you looking at it? Is it available? Is it accessible by our data scientists? All those are very important considerations. Finally, uh, just like uh, uh, data infrastructure, our technology infrastructure is very important. You know, what is your software approach? And uh, you know, when we started our organization, I like to say we were software agnostic. I don't feel like that's necessarily the proper approach anymore. I feel like you need to actually have a defined software approach. And so, you know, R and Python are obviously, uh, you know, kind of the front runners within the data science field. SAS, which is my background, um, you know, has kind of fallen out of favor over the last decade. But uh, especially with deep learning and all the, uh, all the new libraries and capabilities, you see Python really rising. So at, Amazon, or at Anadarko, we really put an emphasis on uh, Python. What are your hardware resources? You know, what are you providing to your team? Uh, we view it as a hybrid approach. So we provide uh, individual workstations to so most of our data scientists that are fairly, fairly powerful so that our data scientists can work on local problems and uh, you know, they can, on their actual workstations with NVIDIA P6000 cards. Next, as we scale up, we, uh, we have NVIDIA DGX boxes so that we can work on some of the more complex problems. You know, some of the, the seismic work that you saw uh, Ping you know, talk about earlier 
you know, was performed on our NVIDIA DGX boxes. Next, we're looking at uh, leveraging, you know, we're down the pathway of leveraging uh, GCP for TPUs and GPUs as we, as we further scale, as we further uh, move to production. What's your model deployment strategy? There's a number of platforms. If you're like me, you probably receive emails daily from vendors selling a platform or selling a software. Um, so there's a number of different platforms that you can use as you're building out, you know, what is my deployment strategy? How am going, I going to take these models, these prototypes, and put them in the hands of the user? Because as much as we develop all these different prototypes and, and cool models, if we don't put them in the hands of the end user or the decision maker, they're worthless. Yeah. So we need to th think about what is our model deployment strategy. Is it Docker? Uh, you know, on site we use Docker and, and Pivotal Cloud Foundry and uh, using GCP uh, for cloud services. Finally, gone are the days of the adversarial relationship between the business and IT. You need to have a very close collaboration with IT. They're providing you with the infrastructure. They're providing you with the compute, the technology. They're supporting it. They're productionalizing a lot of your prototypes and a lot of your models. And so you need to work closely with them. They may be refactoring your models and your prototypes. They may be adding additional features that you don't care about, you don't think about. Authentication, access, security, all of those different elements. So you need to work very closely with your IT and your technology um, you know, partners and uh, build great relationships there. It's not always easy, but uh, you know, that's required. So, um, well, I'll just highlight a couple of our projects, and since it's an HPC conference, just mentioning a few of our projects that are kind of more in the HPC area. Um, you know, won't touch on this too much. Uh, Ping provided a presentation on some of our seismic inversion interpretation. You can actually take a picture of this slide. It's all not our stuff. So, um, unfortunately, Ping, we couldn't get uh, approval to uh, uh, show his slides. So, but. Uh, um, you know, we're doing a number of interesting problems in the seismic domain, from interpretation to looking then into inversion and processing as well. As we move to onshore, uh, you know, onshore rapid basin eva evaluation. Used to be when we want to uh, evaluate a basin, it would take us, you know, six months to a year to fully evaluate that basin. So we've applied a number of techniques that we've been able to take that down to approximately six weeks. We're now using uh, deep learning uh, for uh, propagating uh, uh, tops across a basin so that uh, you know, we can characterize that, 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 those tops. We, we're also using uh, machine learning for um, QCing well logs. And so incorporating those components as well into our rapid basin evaluation, we can further reduce the cycle times or we can at, at least look at additional information, you know, thousands of wells that we weren't able to take into account previously. And I don't think I'll touch on these. Everyone's pretty much doing those, so. In conclusion, uh, you know, we have a number of challenging and diverse problems at Anadarko, and in, in order to work those problems, we need the talent, we need the workforce that's required to work those. And as I mentioned, I feel like there's five components for, for developing a, uh, an organization that you need to consider, you need to think through. You can't just do this you know, ad hoc, shooting from the hip. You have to actually put careful thought and consideration as you're building this organization. We don't want our data scientists to be these high-performing Ferraris that are up on blocks. You know, we want to unleash them. We want them to reach their full potential. Thank you for your time. We have time for a couple of questions. Nice talk, Jeremy. Uh, could you comment on basically, I mean, culture assistance in the company? Because I guess there are groups are concerned about being replaced by whatever the data scientists are doing in the company. Could you mention some I'm of those challenges? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first oh, part. The, the, I'm talking about the cultural, I mean, uh, resistance 
inside the company. There may be people, your scientists, engineers, that may be doubtful about what the scientists can do. So how they, uh, what is the feedback they obtain from them when they feel like uh, the job may be threatened by some of the results that the, the, the data science group can, can generate? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think there is a lot of fear that, uh, you know, some of the models that we're going to de develop, some of these capabilities are going to take away some of these jobs. That's not how I view it. I, I think we're developing augmented intelligence. When we look at, uh, you know, for instance, you know, Anadarko is the largest leaseholder in the Gulf of Mexico. We, you know, if we were using traditional workflows to look at these large blocks of seismic data, it would take us many, many years to go through it. But now we can provide capabilities so that our interpreters can actually go through that in quicker cycle times, and they can put thought to that. And so I, I think it's actually enhancing what, the, what those subject matter experts can do. It's not replacing their jobs. Now, uh, that said, I think that there is an evolution for those roles. You know, if, if you're a geologist and you're stuck to hand contouring maps, you know, and now a machine can come in and can do that better, then you need to shift your thinking. You know, what other types of roles can I play? How can I use this technology to actually, you know, do other things more efficiently? So I, I think, I think you know, it's a partnership, it's a, it's a culture, learning what capabilities we can bring to help you to, to better perform in your job. But, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's always a role for those, for those domain experts. So we have a question over in the corner there. Um, I have a quick question on your agile style uh, you talk about, because uh, for traditional software engineering, uh, it's been several years and uh, the Agile workflow is pretty established that basically you ship the product and the fix box. Uh, but for data science related projects, it's first uh, data related. So basically it's time consuming to QC the data in the first place. And also uh, you have to have time to find out the applicability of the models to your data. So how do you incorporate those concerns into your agile workflow? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, some of our work, you're, you're absolutely right. If you're working a two week sprint, you might be focused on, on one single element because your data is in such, such a state that that's your focus for two weeks. Um, you know, it, do, it doesn't always fit, you know, exactly the way you would like, but um, you know, what we do like about agile is it's, it, you're getting the collaboration with the team, the constant feedback, the, the identification of the tasks that you're working, and so you're discussing those. Um, you're, you're right though, you know, for certain problems, there needs to be a shift back to, okay, I'm, I'm going off, I'm gonna research this, I'm gonna work on this for a month, and then I'll come back and, and share my results. So um, I, I, you can't, be completely constrained rigidly to a single approach. You have to use what's best for the different projects and work. So I'm gonna do actually a question. I'm gonna take the, the liberty of being the, the moderator. So, so you're bringing uh, uh, domain scientists into your team and that was an important part of it. Mm -hmm. Do they get to rotate? That's part one of that. So they actually don't, don't get fully embedded. Uh, part two is, do you think that uh, these data science teams at some point will actually just be business as usual and they will be actually back in their, their teams? So uh, to the first point, we have already done some rotations out of the organization of our subject matter experts. And we'll probably in 2018 do some additional. So we did a few in 2017, we'll probably do additional. So there is a rotation and we, th we feel like that's required. Are we at the right cadence of rotating? Maybe not yet, but um, you know that's required to establish connections with the business and, and spread that back through the business. The second point was... Um, yeah, do, you, do your team eventually just be business as usual, data science happen in the domains? Yeah, so the, so the problem I have with that approach is just sticking data scientists out in the different business. Um, you know, what we've seen is... Or maybe if, they're not data scientists. They are now scientists doing work with data. You're right, you're right. Just want to challenge you. <laughs> The difficulty that we've seen there is, um, you know, if you don't have a data science type of organization, just as like you don't have a engineering structure or a geoscience structure, what are your career advancements opportunities? Your data scientists are not going to become asset managers most likely. 
You know, so what are the career advancement opportunities? Also, if you send somebody out into an asset, they're not learning from other data scientists. They're not staying up on technology, and this is an ever-changing field. So they need that collaboration. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll just take that offline afterwards. So th let's uh, thank Jeremy again for. Uh...